Now here's our first lung sound. This is rails. Some people call it crackles. So what rails is, we have fluid in the lungs. So I'm gonna show you how we combat that in EMS in a moment. But let's break this down. We hear rails. The big question is, is it bilateral rails on both sides of the lungs? Or is it just on one side? So if we hear it on both sides, we can pretty much with good certainty think more and lean towards more of this being CHF heart failure. We'll talk about a few more key factors too. On the other side, rails could also be an early onset of pneumonia. Later stage pneumonia would be more rock eye. I'll talk about that later. But we want to think rails, there's fluid or blood, there's wet lungs going on right now, right? So how do we differentiate CHF and pneumonia? Well, pneumonia has fever, has chills. There could be some body aches, right? Because there's an infection pathway. Green and yellow sputum they're coughing up, right? So that's more on the pneumonia side. But also, could you have bilateral pneumonia? Yes, but it's not as common as one side pneumonia is. So we just hear on one side, nothing on the other at all. Then we are leading towards the pneumonia, right? Okay. Now, with CHF, the big key, pink frothy sputum because you're coughing up. You're, you know, that, that sputum, that very cough of blood, right? Then the other thing we look at is hypertension and then JVD, right? Remember, I always say, blood backs up, right? So, with CHF, that's something we want to look out. In this case, you have blood backing up in the system, in the body. Could be like pedal edema, JVD, but in this case, we are rails backing up into the lungs. So if we have a CHF, what do we do? Well, a few things that can help, okay? Positive pressure ventilations could help, of course, if your patient needs to be ventilated. But in reality, your patient is gonna be usually awake and talking to you. We're gonna do CPAP and then nitro. Nitro is gonna decrease the preload in the patient. Of course, you wanna do an EKG, but CPAP is our main treatment for this CHS. Now on pneumonia, the biggest thing is pneumonia usually is gonna lower your oxygen levels. So you wanna give oxygen to that patient and then continue to assess how severe they are. What else are we gonna do? Do we hear a wheeze where we might wanna give them albuterol, for example, right? So we consider these things with this patient. Yep, that is wheezing. Now with a wheezing patient, what we have is tight lungs. The bronchioles are being constricted. So your patient has a hard time breathing. Maybe they're in the tripod position, right? Maybe they're only speaking in one or two word sentences. What causes bronchoconstriction? The mnemonic to remember this, the memorization tool is AAC, asthma anaphylaxis, COPD, they're going to wheeze and have bronchoconstriction issues, tight lungs, bronchoconstriction. How do we treat this? We know what it sounds like. How do we treat this? Well, a few medications. So albuterol is going to open up the tight airways. So there's with asthma especially, there is kind of a ranking where you'll see a patient who's having an asthma attack and you kind of put them on continuous NEVs and they do well. So we give them albuterol, we keep giving them continuous albuterol. Ibotropium dries up secretions. So with this wheezing, especially with asthma and aflaxis, COPD, you can have also hypersecretion as well going on in the lung fields. So that is why the drug ibotropium can be given in that as a dual neb via nebulizer. Now, epinephrine, we know epi, like an EpiPen, that's given automatically for anaphylaxis. But we can also give epi for severe asthma, right? So if we get a severe asthma patient, the final signs are unstable with the patient, right? We can give an epi IM, right? So that's gonna be epinephrine. What's epinephrine gonna do? Open up the lungs. So epinephrine acts on your beta-2 receptor. And when the beta-2 receptor is activated, it causes bronchodilation. The same receptor albuterol acts on. The epi gives a little more punch, it's a little stronger. 
Cyamedrol. Well, think about this. We have an inflammatory process going on right now. So we can use a steroid, an anti-inflammatory, like Cyamedrol, a steroid, to help with that. It's not going to help immediately, but you want to start that as soon as you can. It's going to help that process. Then finally here we have magnesium. Now magnesium, if you don't know, can be used in cardiac, OBGYN cases, and respiratory because magnesium is a smooth muscle relaxant. So kind of the last stage here, let's say you got a really severe asthma patient, you give continuous NEBS, give Epi, give Cyamedrol, you're transporting, maybe if you have a long transport time, the patient's pretty critical. You could do a magnesium drip. Remember, magnesium is measured in grams, not milligrams or micrograms, grams, magnesium. And you would drip that in over a period of time, follow your protocol, and that can help your wheezing patient. I don't hear anything, do you? What if we hear and we listen and we hear an absent chest? First, check your scope, make sure it's working. And check to make sure it's working. You can hear it, you're tapping it, I mean, you hear it. We have an absent chest. There's two things we gotta, big things we gotta look out for. So really the question is, do we hear absent sounds, no sounds? or diminished sounds, if you will. You may have heard the word diminished or absent sounds. Diminished, we can barely hear absent, hear nothing. If we hear diminished or absent sounds on both sides, both sides, bilaterally, I'm thinking more of severe constriction, which severe broad, it's so bad I can't even hear a wheeze, right? This is, again, treat it, NEBS, Epi, Meg, Cyamedrol. But what if I'm at a traumatic patient? So this is more medical, right? What if I met with a car accident patient and I hear, or anyone who, it could be medical too, because remember, pneumothorax, yes, it's trauma, but tall, lanky people can have a medical pneumothorax too. What if on one side I hear absent or diminished, the other side's fine? Then we start looking for signs and symptoms of a tension pneumothorax or an unsimple pneumothorax. JVD. Remember that, jugular vein extension, neck, trachea deviation, the trachea is off its position, it's moving, high heart rates, low blood pressure. How do we treat that? At the bls EMT level, give high flow oxygen, rapid transport. Paramedic level, needle decompression. What happens in pneumothorax is we have air that has entered inside the chest. And this air is compressing up and collapsing the lung. The lung basically has a puncture in it, right? Which is causing the lung to get smaller and smaller and smaller because it's being pushed by air in the pearl space. Your lung is literally collapsing. So this air that's pushing on the lung, we put a needle in the chest, it allows that air to escape. And the lung now can reinflate. And what a feeling that is that is now able to be reinflated. And you literally saved your patient. In a hospital, they're going to put a chest tube in there to maintain that for even longer. And on a really long transport, you may have heard, you might need a needle once and then needle again if it gets worse. So just a quick pearl. That is Ronkai. Say it with me. Ronkai, you got junk in your lungs. You hear Ronkai? You got junk in your lung. For always remember that rest of your career, Ronka, you got junk in your lung. This infection pathway, I think about pneumonia, illness, infection, green yellow sputum, could be a cough, could, could be painful to breathe, right? Do, do, you think, do they need airway support? Where are they at? Do they need ventilation? Uh, do they need other uh, airway de devices to assist them? That's what we want to look at here. We're evaluating this patient. How far along are they with this infection? Are they speaking in one or two word sentences? How laborers are breathing? What sort of two sap? Give oxygen as needed. Chills, fever, body aches, infection. Wrong guys, infections. Remember, you could have pneumonia on both sides, but it's usually on one side, but you could have bilateral pneumonia. It's definitely possible. But if you're on one side, wrong guy, ugh, you might have pneumonia. Think about these things. 
That is Strider. Now, wait a second. This is the lung sound video. All right, Strider is an upper airway. Your lungs are down here in the lower airway. So Strider is an upper airway sound. But I want to include it for you here. So it's Strider. We got to think that the upper airway is closing, is enlarged, it is tightening of the upper airways. That's Strider. It is a major, major medical emergency. Okay. Now, one thing I did put on here is, I said medical, this could be caused by trauma. So a little bonus here I put in here is, let's just say, for example, you could have Strider from direct trauma to your upper airway. So that's a little bonus tip. But here are the main five. So first is going to be croup. Croup and epiglottitis, these are pediatric conditions. The key to remember is this. Croup is more gradual. Epiglottitis is more instance. With croup, you have a barking cough. Epiglottitis, you have drooling. You, it's, it, it's painful. Croup, you have that classic barking cough. Croup happens to people around four years old. Epiglottitis can happen to anyone, even an adult. Epiglottitis is simply put, it's inflammation of the epiglottis. So croup is an infection. So is epiglottitis can be an infection as well. But think about these things to differentiate, right? The other thing we have is airway inhalation burn. So if someone's involved in a fire, we can have an inhalation burn of the upper airway that causes strider. Look for any soot or anything on the face that may clue you in, or if they're involved in a fire, then we obviously clue it in. FBO has a foreign body airway obstruction. So legitimately, do we have a partially occluded airway, right? If we are strider, it's still, it's partially occluded. If we hear nothing and it's absent, they're not breathing, well, they could have a full airway obstruction. At the par paramedic level, it's been called, I'll put a picture of McGill four steps. So what you would do is use a little rotoscope blade, you'd open the airway, you'd visualize the obstruction and then take it out if it was a full obstruction, right? We want to try and help the patient clear it and, or cough it and try to get it down if it's partially. Or if we have to get it, we can still go get it. And then anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis, obviously, is two or more body systems being affected by an allergen. So, for example, nausea, vomiting, wheezing, hives. That's anaphylaxis, right? So anaphylaxis can also cause strider and wheezing as well. So watch out for that. And of course, with that pathway, Benadryl, Epi, Nebs, usually they're nauseous, like Zofran stuff. So those are things we want to look for with anaphylaxis patients. Now, a lot of you asked in the comments about how to prepare for school, how to get through school, and how to pass NREMT. The first link in the description is a study tool that I give to all my students to accomplish all of that. It's called the Video Vault. Inside the video vault is over 480 videos of content, audio files, worksheets, practice quizzes, our community group. What I do in the video vault is take all the concepts you need to know to pass school at NREMT and I break them down simply for you. So that way you just follow along with the videos, you follow the study plan and you pass. I give my students lifetime access in the first link in the description and I'll see you on the inside.